Hi everyone, welcome. I am Gaby Salinas, Managing Director of Brand Finance Institute, which is the educational and training division of Brand Finance, which offers world-class executive training on brand strategy and valuation. Thank you for joining the third webinar in our series. And we have um, participants from over 20 countries. Um, this is the last webinar in our series. And throughout this series, we have explored topics around brand leadership in times of crisis, Today's webinar will focus on intangible assets, how their role have evolved with trends such as the rise of uh, big data and digital technology, issues with the current financial reporting of intangibles and the benefits of understanding your business's intangibles, particularly in times of financial hardship. The session will be led by Annie Brown, Senior Consultant at Brown Finance and Savi de Sousa, Valuation Director at Brown Finance. Just a quick note on housekeeping, uh, the session will be interactive and we will incorporate real-time surveys. The format will follow a 30-40 minute presentation by Annie and Savio, and this will be followed by a 15 um, um, minute Q&A session. You can submit your questions to our presenters through the Q&A tool, and um, we will be sharing the recording of the webinar after the session. Also, if you would like to access our Global Intangible Financial Tracker Report, please check our website and the link in the chat box. And um, the next report will be um, out in October, so watch space for that. We also kindly request that on leaving the webinar, you fill out the survey providing feedback that will be helpful for us to develop future webinars. Finally, I would like to encourage all of you to engage with us on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, with the hashtag BF5 webinar and the Brand Finance Institute handle at BF-Institute on Twitter. So now, without further ado, I um, will leave it up to um, Annie and Savio to take the stage. Thank you, Gabby. Hi, my name is Annie Brown. Um, I'm a senior consultant at Brand Finance. Thank you for introducing the webinar, Gabby. So today we're going to be talking about undisclosed balance sheet versus reality. First of all, we'll talk about what in intangible assets are, um, and then we'll be talking about the global value evolution of intangible assets. And finally, we'll be talking about some issues surrounding intangible asset reporting currently. So first of all, what do we mean by intangible assets? Um, under the IFRS definition, an intangible asset is an asset which is identifiable, non-monetary, and doesn't have physical substance. So what does that all mean? So first of all, being identifiable means that it's either separable from your business, so you could, you could sell it separately from your business, or that it arises from a legal or contractual right. So for example, the trademark that you may have registered against your brand makes it identifiable. Um, Non-monetary is quite self-explanatory, but that clarifies that this does not include financial instruments and without physical substance, so it's nothing tangible. And under IFRS, they provide guidance of different categories of intangible assets. Um, the most prevalent intangible asset across balance sheets is something called goodwill, which arises when an acquisition has taken place and is essentially the balancing figure between identified um, value that has been acquired and the price paid for the transaction. And this is said to represent the future synergies um, that have arisen due to that acquisition. So it's essentially a reflection of future excess profits that are expected. The more interesting intangible assets are those which belong to five distinct asset classes. Um, artistic intangibles, um, so that might include literary works or musical works. Um, marketing, which involves your brand and any web domains that you may have. Um, customer intangibles, so this primarily things like your customer relationships or contracts that you may have with those customers. And then more broadly, um, all types of contracts and technology, so things such as um, digital technology capabilities or your um, any developing software. So when we consider how these intangibles fit into the balance sheet, um, we're going to be giving an example of the Amazon business. So first of all, on their balance sheets, of course, they have tangible assets. Um, they have the value of their warehouses, the value of any machinery and equipment that they have, and the value of their inventory, among other things. In terms of Amazon, though, what drives their uniqueness and their value 
of the intangibles that they've generated over time. So across the different classes, some of the most important ones for Amazon are the value of the Amazon brand, the value of their customer relationships and their customer contracts through Amazon Prime, and the unique technology that underpins the platform. However, under IFRS, most of these they can't disclose on their balance sheet. Um, technology is the exception in some circumstances where R&D expenditure can be proven to be um, providing a future asset. So when they can include intangible assets on their balance sheet, however, is when they have acquired somebody else. So in 2017, Amazon acquired Whole Foods Market. When they did that, under IFRS, they were required to recognise the value of all specific intangibles that they've acquired. In addition, the, as we were talking about earlier, the goodwill, the balancing figure between how much money was paid for Whole Foods versus all of the tangible and intangible assets, um, minus any liabilities that they've acquired, is allocated to goodwill. So the shape of the Amazon balance sheet includes these items. In reality, these items only represent about 9% of total market value of Amazon. So when we're looking at the market value of, of um, Amazon's equity and its debt, about 90% of it is undisclosed on the balance sheet. So investors um, have built that value through having faith in the future performance of the company, but there's no evidence of it anywhere on a balance sheet. And independent valuation agencies such as Brand Finance estimate the value of these different intangibles. Um, according to our latest study, we've estimated that the Amazon brand value is worth over $200 billion. The remaining undisclosed value um, is driven by and investors having faith in future profits of the business. And so if you think about, again, what makes Amazon unique and what makes them strong as a company, it's the specific assets that they have in terms of Amazon Prime and the customer relationships, Amazon Web Services and the software that, un that underpins that, and even the artificial intelligence that is developed to support the Amazon Alexa products. All of these have intangible asset components. And due to the limitations which stop Amazon from listing these intangible values on their balance sheets, this is why we argue that the majority of undisclosed value for a company is intangible value. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is the evolution of intangible asset value over time. Every year since 2001, Brand Finance have done a significant study called the Global Intangible Finance Tracker, or GIFT for short where we look at the total value of all companies listed publicly, um, and we allocate their value between four different categories. So we've already talked about these categories in relation to Amazon, but first of all, the dark blue here represents um, tangible net assets. And then we have three categories of intangibles. Uh, first of all, disclosed specific intangible assets, excluding goodwill. So this is things like acquired brand values, acquired contract values. And then there is disclosed goodwill. Um, so that's again, acquired goodwill. Um, as you can see over time, disclosed goodwill has always been greater than the value of disclosed intangible assets, which is why goodwill is such a prevalent and important intangible asset to focus on. And then the largest intangible asset class in terms of value is undisclosed value. And in fact, uh, as of the 1st of January this year, undisclosed intangible value reached an all-time high of over $45 trillion. Since then, with the outbreak of COVID-19 and the subsequent impact on global economies, the total value of all companies has fallen by 19%. And this is second only to the fall that we saw in 2008. Um, and what happens when, when total company value falls is that undisclosed value acts as a cushion. The, the value of, um, of assets which are listed on books is very sticky. Um, tangible assets values are only updated um, in either annually or quarterly or, or semi-annually. Whereas the um, undisclosed value is the cushioning amount between the um, pretty much uh, instantaneously updated market value of a company and the book value. So what we would see here is pretty much a half of the value of undisclosed value, while the rest of the assets would be appearing to be consistent, um, which is slightly misleading because 
um, it's just due to a time lag effect in reporting. The good news of this, of course, is that there is always a rebound in undisclosed intangible value following a crisis. And some have predicted that, particularly here in the UK, um, the rebound of this crisis and recession is going to be really quick. So for companies who are looking further ahead into the future, the important thing is understanding how you can convince investors that your company is going to be one of the most successful ones who are going to strive and come out of the crisis. And one of the key tools for that is going to be understanding your intangible asset value. And of course, some industries have a higher reliance on intangible assets um, and some of them, um, tangible assets are still remain more important. So heavy industry sectors such as mining, um, utilities, airlines, oil and gas still have a strong proportion of tangible assets in their total company value. Um, however, cosmetics, um, where a lot of the value is, is driven by having new products and new technology um, and having a, a really strong brand, um, has plays a bigger role in driving to overall business value. Therefore, for some sectors, the role of intangibles is more is higher. In addition, as a whole, the role of intangibles has grown over time. Looking strictly at the S and P five hundred since nineteen seventy five, you can see that the composition of total value has shifted from being only about seventeen percent of intangible asset value to over 77% today. So it's well understood and well documented by people other than us that, um, as well as us, that intangible assets are significantly valuable, they can drive business value, and they're an important asset to be able to understand, even if they're not on balance sheets. And we're now going to talk about some issues in intangible asset reporting. The first issue that we will talk about is goodwill impairment. The second issue is about the undervaluation of specific intangibles surrounding M&A. And then finally, we'll be talking about internally generated intangibles. Now, we'd like to invite you to take part in a short survey to tell us what you think about um, some of these issues. So I'm going to be launching a poll now. If you could please submit your responses to the poll that's on screen, and then I'll share the results with everybody. So we now have, uh, the majority of you have, have voted, so thank you to those of you who've responded. Um, so, the majority of people say that their organisations don't have a system to measure intangible asset value currently. And the majority don't think that intangible assets are well understood and manage their organisation. And finally, uh, the majority don't think enough is done to communicate the value of intangible assets to your shareholders. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, um, you will be more informed and well equipped to be able to hopefully change and be motivated to change the, the way that intangible assets are, are reported. And it'd be great in the Q&A se uh, session if we could hear from some of those of you who, who do have a system to measure intangibles and if you could share um, the benefits that you've received as, as a result of that. So the first issue with intangible asset reporting is surrounding goodwill impairment. There are two ways to treat goodwill um, once it's been um, recorded in a balance sheet. 
And the first way is goodwill amortization, and the other is goodwill impairment. Um, amortization is the method of um, setting a useful life for that goodwill. And gradually eroding it each year by taking um, an expense and essentially again um, a process of testing each year whether that value has been diminished. Um, potentially there's a new competitor or potentially the um, post-merger integration has not gone to plan. Um, both of these methods have their drawbacks um, and impairment is the prevalent method um, across um, jurisdictions that use IFRS, um, also under US GAAP, uh, but some jurisdictions do still use amortization, such as Japan and UK GAAP. Um, the issue surrounding amortization um, is that there's no informational value at all to investors. So for an investor who wants to understand how the company is doing in terms of integrating a company that they've acquired, just amortizing um, goodwill annually at a set rate doesn't provide any indication to the investors of, of how that integration is going. And in addition, setting that useful economic life is extremely judgmental. And usually there's a maximum um, period of 20 years, which again is um, quite high level and judgmental and doesn't provide much informational value. Impairment, on the other hand, if used properly, should provide informational value to investors because an, an impairment of goodwill indicates that future performance is not going to be as good as previously expected. However, for many reasons, um, the decision about whether or not to impair is highly subjective. Um, it's a decision usually taken by management and their expectations of the future of the company that they've acquired. Um, and the way that goodwill is actually, uh, goodwill impairment is actually, cal actually calculated is you value the um, entire business, you deduct charges for the assets that you have values for, so both your tangibles and your specific intangibles, and then the balancing figure is what is still left for goodwill. And so if the value of your other assets are, are underestimated, then it creates what's known as a headroom or shielding effect, um, and may mean that you continue to attribute value to goodwill, which should be attributed elsewhere. Um, Oftentimes in practice, the criticism of goodwill impairment is that the information provided to investors, while more useful than amortization, is still too little and too late, as in the goodwill impairment is too small and the information provided to investors is too late. And this is a prevalent issue because one in three listed entities report goodwill on their balance sheet. For the majority of these entities, goodwill represents between zero and 10% of, of business value. And this is what many people would consider a healthy amount of goodwill. Um, however, there are some companies which have what we call abnormal goodwill, where goodwill represents more than the total value of the business, which is a market indicator that your, your goodwill needs to be impaired because the market does not value your company um, to allow for goodwill of that size. So in 2019, we, had, we looked at how many companies which have goodwill on their balance sheet actually took an impairment against that goodwill. Only 10% of companies took an impairment. And this changes slightly depending on whether you have healthy amount of goodwill or if you have abnormal goodwill. So for companies who've had um, goodwill between zero and 10% for one year, as you can see in red here, 8% of them took an impairment against goodwill. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, where goodwill is, exceeds 100% of business value and is abnormal, the highest rate of impairment is where that has been the case for two years for an entity. Of those companies, 27% impair goodwill. Now, while that seems like an improvement, that still means almost three quarters of those companies didn't take any impairment against their goodwill, despite it representing over 100% of their total business value for two years running. So it doesn't seem like market indicators cause people to take impairments of goodwill. However, what we can now consider is, does market indicators of goodwill impairment impact the amount of impairment which is taken? So what we'd expect is where there is abnormal goodwill in a company and it represents a high share of business value, most of that goodwill should be impaired when impairments are taken. So we expect a positive relationship between the significance of goodwill and how much of it is impaired versus its carrying amount before the impairment. 
in reality, the relationship is non-existent or negative. Um, and most of the significant goodwill impairments happen where there is a healthy amount of goodwill. So what do these big impairments have in common? We looked at the biggest goodwill impairments that occurred in 2019, the biggest of which was the almost 9 billion impairment that Schlumberger took against their goodwill from the acquisition of Smith International. Um, and um, there were some other significant goodwill impairments too. Um, the blue bar, the light blue bar represents a uh, goodwill impairment that occurred in 2019 and the dark blue represents um, goodwill impairment that that same company took in 2018. So as you can see, the majority of these um, goodwill impairments were a one-off and just happened this year. Um, some people are concerned that um, new CEOs and new CFOs use impairment of goodwill as a way to um, temporarily reduce their share price um, so that any future performance and improvement in the share price after that is accredited to them. Um, in addition, people are aware that taking an impairment against your goodwill um, reduces the carrying amount of your re uh, retained earnings and that can have an impact on executive bonuses. So did any of these companies have either a new CEO or new CFO this year? Well, yes, the majority. Uh, the majority had a new CEO, some had a new CEO and a new CFO, and some had just a new CFO. So the ones which didn't have new leadership this year, Procter & Gamble and CenturyLink. So Procter & Gamble is actually a really good example of um, providing good information to investors about goodwill impairment. This um, goodwill impairment was against the Gillette business, um, which they said um, is no longer expected to um, achieve the initially anticipated um, returns due to raising competition from um, Dollar Buyers Club. Um, and CenturyLink, on the other hand, um, did not have a new CEO or new CFO this year. But when we see their impairment last year, they also had a new CEO and new CFO then. And when we look at all of the goodwill impairments, we see that most of them occur with new leadership. In fact, 30% of all goodwill impairments um, in 2019 uh, had a new CEO or a new CFO this year. So there's an issue with the management of, in, of goodwill impairment and the IASB have called for greater scrutiny from auditors and regulators surrounding the things like the forecasts and the assumptions that are used um, by management when determining the future value of their, of their business. Um, and Therefore, there needs to be um, more needs to be done in, in order to make sure that goodwill impairment is done accurately and in time in order to keep, keep investors informed um, about the performance of those acquisitions. But another solution is that initially, when the acquisition is made, less value is attributed to goodwill in the first place. And I'm going to pass on to Sadio now, and he's going to talk about how uh, recognizing the value of specific intangibles recognizing their full value can have benefits both to how you report goodwill but also to how you manage those intangibles. Thanks Annie. Um, hi everyone, it's Javier speaking. Um, so the next section um, concentrates on how specific intangibles are undervalued. Next slide please Annie. Um, so just revisiting um, uh, the Whole Foods Amazon uh, situation. So in 2017, when Amazon acquired Whole Foods for about 13 billion uh, US dollars, um, as per the accounting rules, um, they were supposed to um, account for it through a purchase price account um, acquisition uh, and give a breakdown of the different assets underneath it. Um, they so the red represents the goodwill uh, and the blue box at the top represents the brand value, the value attributed to the Whole Foods brand at about 1.9 billion uh, US dollars. Um, when we compare this to um, our own uh, publicly available valuation uh, for the Whole Foods brand, uh, it was almost double at about 3.8 billion uh, US dollars for the Whole Foods brand. Um, 
and there are a number of uh, reasons why um, uh, why we think um, you know the value uh, is uh, has been underreported in the um, Whole Foods transaction. Uh, the other effect here is uh, that because they undervalued uh, the brand, uh, the amount of goodwill on the books is actually you know, much larger than it should be. Um, one of the other issues that we noticed um, in this you know, purchase price allocation is that uh, other intangibles, uh, such as uh, a customer loyalty program that they have for Whole Foods, uh, was not separately uh, valued and was uh, bundled, bundled into um, goodwill. Uh, so again, um, the informational value um, of that uh, PPA uh, was reduced, uh, we believe. If we go to the next slide. Um, so it's quite um, so we thought it'd be quite interesting to look at um, it from an M&A perspective in terms of how specific uh, entanglements are undervalued um, and you know how um, you can bridge the gap uh, between um, due diligence that takes place um, and, at different types uh, different times during an M&A uh, deal flow and how a better understanding of the uh, of a company's IP assets um, to de determine their real value can actually bring um, benefits to uh, your business. So we've structured it into three main parts on the next slide, which is um, in terms of uh, what should, how do you go about understanding intangible value uh, in a pre-deal phase, in a post-deal phase, and then finally, how do you actually activate it once you understand uh, what the size of the price is or the value uh, that is at stake? So um, if you go to the next slide, we have a couple of case studies on each of these um, uh, phases. Um, so typically in pre-deal phase, uh, you know, you'd expect um, uh, to do um, diligence on you know, what your key customers and stakeholders think of the brand, uh, what are the perception of the brand, how strong it is uh, versus the competition, are there any reputation issues that you need to be aware of. A um, good example um, where um, it, that brand didn't do so well was with Ford in the early 1990s when they acquired Jaguar Land Rover uh, for uh, about 2.5 billion US dollars. Um, at the time, analysts uh, were up in arms uh, because they said that was completely overvalued uh, at about five times their actual book value. Um, the chairman of JLR, it uh, turns out, had done a very good job of uh, selling the Jaguar and Land Rover brands to the Ford management uh, by leaning on their um, racing heritage. Um, so the Ford executives actually didn't do any due diligence on, um, uh, on the JLR business that they acquired. Uh, and when they actually uh, took control of it, they realized that uh, while the heritage still meant something to consumers, uh, customers and non-customers, um, it was slowly being eroded uh, because of two main issues. One was quality um, and customer satisfaction. So the quality of uh, the products uh, was very bad. Uh, the actual production facilities were outdated by about 30, 30 years. Uh, and they didn't had no after sales service uh, to speak of. Um, so it took forward another 15 years to almost turn the company around. Uh, but in the process of doing that, they were so um, distracted uh, from this project that um, their core business suffered. And when the financial crisis hit in about 2007, 2008, uh, it almost brought the whole uh, business down, uh, which is when you know, they sold the business eventually to uh, the Tata Group uh, from India for about 2.3 billion US dollars, uh, while taking a few impairments um, um, uh, along the way. Um, so that's an, a, you know, an example of where um, due diligence at the start uh, would have helped avoid um, the significant um, you know, loss of value. Uh, next example where an acquirer actually had a good idea uh, of the potential of uh, brand and brand value was the acquisition of Manisman uh, initially and then France Telecom uh, of uh, the orange brand in the UK 
Um, at the time, in the early 2000s, telecoms uh, was a booming uh, sector, unlike today, uh, and um, mergers and acquisitions were very common. Um, and in the UK, uh, Deutsche Telekom bought T-Mobile, uh, management ended up buying Orange. Um, both of them uh, had very similar business structures. So they had the same physical assets, they had the same uh, retail distribution. Uh, but the key difference was that the Orange uh, management uh, decided on building a differentiated uh, brand uh, that was more um, distinctive and resonant among its consumers. Uh, and which meant that they had higher loyalty, so lower churn, uh, which meant that the lifetime value of customers was actually double that of uh, T-Mobile, uh, which is why uh, while analysts were first uh, were concerned about the uh, value of the acquisition, which is about double what per customer compared to T-Mobile, uh, in the end, it actually turned out that they had uh, paid a fair price uh, for the uh, Orange brand. Uh, as it happens, uh, when France Telecom took over Orange, uh, they recognized the value of the Orange brand and actually rolled it out under, under a um, licensing strategy to its remaining markets uh, and to its uh, B2B uh, division. And finally, even rebranded the corporate uh, uh, name uh, from France Telecom to Orange, uh, just showing the power of the, of the brand amongst the investor community um, as well. Um, so two contrasting uh, examples of how uh, pre-deal understanding of uh, brand um, and brand strengths uh, can lead to different, uh, different outcomes. In the next uh, slide, uh, in a post-deal uh, scenario, um, you know, typically uh, be good to understand uh, you, you bought a business, how do you, what's the potential value of the brand? You know, what is the size of the price? Can I go into new categories? Uh, does my brand fit within uh, my current organization? Um, so again, we have two examples here that we thought were quite interesting. Um, so, um, I need you want to click next animation. Yeah, uh, the first one is um, Cadbury uh, in uh, the late 80s uh, started divesting its uh, rationalizing its portfolio in the UK and Ireland. Um, and um, one of the strategy directors of Cadbury at the time uh, recognized the value of these brands and actually led a management buyout because uh, he recognized that the brands that they were hiring off actually held a lot of strong brand equity um, within um, the UK uh, and Ireland uh, among specific uh, segments of the population. Uh, and he recognized that also they were underinvested in historically and with right um, investment and nurturing, they could actually deliver uh, a lot of value. Um, so he led a management buyout uh, at the time they had about 97 million uh, in total revenue and about 6,000 employees. And uh, by the time he exited, uh, I think they had about uh, revenues of about 400 million uh, and they were listed on the London Stock Exchange. Um, another example uh, is um, you know, L'Oreal and uh, the body shop. Uh, so in the late 90s, uh, L'Oreal was looking to tap into uh, the growing movement of ethical and sustainable um, cosmetics. Um, typically, because it was a growing segment, it was more profitable and customers were more loyal. Um, so they understood that you know, the L'Oreal brand couldn't uh, tap into that, so they needed a brand such as The Body Shop, which stood for that, uh, to, um, to tap into that market. Um, what they didn't realize or didn't appreciate uh, was the, um, the level of fit between the two brands uh, was never going to work out. Um, after the merger, a quick survey uh, of key uh, consumers of the body shop uh, found that most of them um, didn't like the um, corporate stance of L'Oreal where there were rumors that they were still testing on animals and they were not seen as a particularly ethical or sustainable business. Well that was the core ethos of, body shop, of the body shop uh, and they said that they would reduce their purchases from the body shop 
uh, and uh, would try and actively look for substitutes. Um, in the short term, um, L'Oreal actually um, didn't see any of these effects because there weren't many alternatives at the time. Uh, but within a couple of years, as alternatives popped up, uh, customers started uh, deserting them. Uh, and actually L'Oreal uh, was sitting on a bit of a problem because they expanded uh, by a uh, big uh, retail uh, footprint and they were saddled with all of these um, physical assets as well. Uh, so they had to take a big write down on the investment and eventually exited by selling it to uh, Natura, which is a Brazilian uh, cosmetics company whose whole positioning is um, being ethical and sustainable and a much uh, better fit for the body shop. In fact, in the three years since the acquisition, the body shop has actually recovered and uh, sales have been increasing um, um, on a consistent basis. Uh, which just shows that um, you know, even though um, uh, you may think that customers do not appreciate the, um, uh, who the eventual owner is, uh, it does play, have an impact uh, amongst uh, uh, highly um, um, relevant and engaged uh, customer base. The next um, um, example um, was around activation. So now that you understand uh, you know, how uh, important value of the brand is in a pre-deal uh, position uh, versus a post-deal. Um, how do you actually go about capturing some of that value? Uh, and how some of, how some of the other brands done it? Um, uh, what, do you have, what do you need to do about marketing spend and how should we allocate it? And these are typically the kind of questions um, that you, you, know, you try to answer to uh, help capture that additional value that the brand can bring. Um, again, going back to an auto example, um, so Volkswagen um, acquired um, Rolls-Royce Motors uh, in 1998 uh, for about 400 million pounds, uh, but the deal excluded uh, the rights to the Rolls-Royce uh, trademark. So they bought the assets uh, and uh, the uh, Bentley name. At the time of acquisition, uh, they sold, uh, most of the units that they sold, the company sold were under the Rolls-Royce trademark with, uh, with a minority under the Bentley trademark. Um, what happened straight after was that BMW, a fierce competitor came in and snapped up Rolls-Royce uh, trademark for a 10th of the value, uh, about 40 million pounds, and started manufacturing it at its own uh, facilities. Um, so, uh, Analysts at the time thought that, uh, rightly thought so, that Volkswagen got the bad end of the deal because Volkswagen was trying to build a luxury portfolio uh, and missed out on you know, the, um, the, uh, the high end of the market at, uh, with the, with the Rolls-Royce badge. So Rolls-Royce and uh, so Volkswagen went back to the drawing board. They realized that their deal included the Bentley trademark uh, and they, would, they tried to work out how to um, leverage uh, the value of the brand, the Bentley brand. What they did was they uh, borrow a lot of attributes from uh, heritage from uh, Rolls-Royce over the next five years. They positioned Bentley as a challenger brand uh, and um, eventually to be an aspirational luxury uh, brand. And they created products um, uh, that matched that. So five years later, when Rolls-Royce uh, was selling about 800 cars per annum. Uh, Bentley, uh, they managed to ramp up production and sales to about 600 per annum, which is quite respectable. But they also did something else, uh, which was to introduce a lower uh, priced uh, car, the Continental GT, uh, which sold about 6,000 units. So what they managed to do was to position the brand as a luxury brand, but also uh, attainable and uh, positioned it towards a younger audience and a more progressive uh, audience. Uh, so they said, oh, we're not, um, you know, we know our market is not the stuffy types who buy Rolls Royce. Uh, we want uh, the younger, uh, cooler demographic. Uh, and that's, that's that marketing uh, and that uh, strategy can still be seen to this day. So Bentley, um, in, in its sibling rivalry with Rolls Royce, was one of the f was first in announcing that they would 
uh, release an SUV, for example, uh, and also develop uh, an electric car with Rolls Royce almost always following. Um, so it's quite interesting in how they've built up the brand um, um, from uh, and almost turned the tables. You could argue that they're probably ahead um, now uh, of Rolls Royce. Okay, and the next slide. Um, so this brings us to the next section, uh, which is um, on internally generated um, intangibles. We just spoke about um, acquired intangibles before, um, and now we talk about internally generated intangibles, which uh, don't um, are not captured on the balance sheet because of um, the um, financial standards that Annie had discussed and before. Uh, so first, we would uh, like you to take part in a short survey. Um, and we can, we'd like to get your thoughts so that we can include them within the Q&A later on. Thanks everyone for taking part in the poll. Um, so the answer to the first question is, uh, is almost unanimous. Uh, do you think investors need more information about acquired intangible assets? Uh, so I mean, almost all of you think yes. Um, and the same for question number two, do you think investors need more quantitative information about internally generated intangible assets? Um, it feels like we're probably preaching to the choir then. Uh, and then finally, <laughs> number three, do you think brand value should be disclosed? Yes, and so um, two thirds of you feel a yes on the balance sheet uh, and a third uh, yes, but only in the notes and uh, a couple saying no. Um, so we will go through some of the arguments uh, for um, how they should be disclosed in the next couple of slides and then we can discuss them more in the Q&A. Um, so the graph um, on, uh, on the slide here uh, shows the value of the undisclosed intangibles um, and how it has grown since uh, 2004. Um, and we've overlaid it with the evolution of um, the different intangible assets um, accounting and reporting standards. So the one that you see on the left hand side well, the financial standards that were set up in the early 2000s, IFRS 3, IS 38, and IS 36, and they haven't really changed much uh, since, uh, since then. But what has happened uh, during that time is that industry practitioners uh, uh, such as ourselves um, have helped and contribute to developing uh, ISO standards for the brand valuation, so ISO 10668, uh, the IVS standard 210 on intangible assets, uh, and the most recently released one on brand evaluation, ISO 2671. Um, what is important uh, to note about the previous slide is the, I think Annie highlighted it before as well, is the proportion of the undisclosed value uh, is um, as big, if not bigger than the actual disclosed value on different balance sheets around the world. Okay. So we often get asked then, so how do you actually manage your own intangibles? Um, especially, you know, within in a crisis, financial crisis such as now, how do you actually use it to uh, generate uh, business value? So typically uh, the steps you would take are, is to um, carry out an assessment, identify your, um, um, your brand, what is the value of the brand, and finally, how does it align to your uh, particular brand and corporate strategy? 
Uh, and once you do the assessment, uh, you can make an informed uh, uh, choice to a decision maker uh, so that they can either have uh, two options. One is, you know, do, do you want to sell to generate additional liquidity or do you want to retain the intangible asset to manage for recovery? Uh, a good case study of this uh, is Burberry, um, where in the early 2000s, uh, again, it was uh, known um, uh, for being past its prime. Um, uh, it had uh, expanded quite aggressively by licensing its brand uh, to different markets and in different segments. Um, there was lots of counterfeit goods on the market, which hurt its uh, image as well. Uh, as an example, you could also buy dog collars uh, for Burberry back in the day. Uh, so in 2006, when uh, Angela Hearns uh, had uh, joined Burberry, uh, she actually went about repositioning the brand and going back to its roots. So she cancelled most of those licensing agreements, cut down on counterfeit, uh, and repositioned the brand as a high-end luxury goods um, brand. And one of the ways that was activated is an example there uh, for a famous campaign that Emma uh, Watson was part of uh, that helped uh, reposition the brand um, as a luxury brand. And then finally, in the next section, um, during her tenure, uh, the value of um, the intangible uh, asset that was undisclosed actually rose threefold. Um, over that time. So this just goes to show that um, there is an appreciation, uh, there needs to be an appreciation for the undisclosed value. Uh, and actually during her tenure in all of her shareholder letters, Angela kept um, saying and uh, pointing towards the strength and value of uh, the um, of the Burberry brand. Um, so next slide is it's going on about uh, why it's important to actually communicate with your shareholders. Uh, so some of the benefits are it gives investors a broad understanding of your business. Uh, it increases the trust between investors and management. Uh, it reduces information asymmetry between investors and specialist analysts. Uh, it can help guide resource allocation internally. So a lot of the time um, you, know, you get asked in, in a current crisis, uh, how can I justify uh, my marketing spend um, and how do I allocate it uh, appropriately? Um, so a, a valuation uh, or an evaluation can help identify um, growth areas and where you should uh, allocate your resources appropriately. Um, and finally, you have must uh, obviously balance um, your communication uh, with the risk of any commercial sensitivity. You wouldn't want to give way commercial the uh, sensitive information um, and just as a recap on the right hand side as Annie went through before um, some of the different asset classes um, of intangible assets not just brand okay and on the next slide um, which is uh, the summary so in our webinar undisclosed balance sheet versus reality we found that um, a significant share of company values are undisclosed the undisclosed value is primarily driven by intangible assets managing um, your own intangible is vital to uh, your um, to your business to support your business and communicating it um, in, you know the value to shareholders uh, and other important stakeholders could be beneficial. Um, the other thing, the second point uh, was on disclosed intangibles are not well understood. Um, we saw that goodwill impairment remains subjective um, and is done um, on an ad hoc basis. And specific un intangibles are undervalued, which, um, which means that goodwill uh, always remains overvalued. And finally, um, what does that mean for us? Uh, so we need to do more rigorous impairment testing. Uh, you have a better understanding of your acquired intangible assets. Uh, and you should, um, the increased understanding um, should lead to, you should uh, ally it with disclosure um, in, in your accounts. Uh, as well, believe, and that, that's what will help um, bridge the gap.
And finally, uh, we can now take your uh, Q&A. Thank you, Annie and Savio, for sharing your perspective on the value and management of intangible assets. Um, now we will move on to Q&A, but before, I would like to encourage um, all of the attendees to engage with us on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, with the hashtag BFI webinar and um, our Brown Finance Institute handle at uh, BFI-Institute on Twitter. Um, let me start with um, the first question that we received from um, Professor Nader Tavasoli from London Business School. He's asking, um, given that impairment only goes down, then um, with an event such as the pandemic, uh, would reduce the informational value, correct? Uh, or can the impairment be avoided uh, with a forecast of recovery? Thank you very much for that question. I think that's a really interesting, relevant topic at the moment. And I think that there's two aspects of that to bear in mind. First of all, um, just explaining an impairment with, with a pandemic is probably not going to be satisfactory for, for your investors. And really what it requires is understanding how the pandemic is really going to impact your business specifically. And, and therefore, what is the meaningful reason for, for why you think business could be adversely impacted? Um, and if it's due to issues in supply chain or if it's issues in physical retail space, that's the kind of um, explanations that provide the informational value which will be useful for investors. Um, the other aspect that should be um, taken into account, which was also part of your question, is is this really a long-term negative impact on, on your business? Because when doing a goodwill impairment, you should be looking at the, the long-term, the uh, mid to long-term forecasts for your business as well as the short-term. So if, for example, you're expecting um, let's go with the previous example, the supply chain issues to be a short-term impact, then um, the future recovery may mean that the resulting value that um, you feel is applicable for your business and the auditors feel is suitable for that business, um, then no goodwill impairment may be necessary. So um, two things really, looking at um, what specifically is impacting your business about the current um, climate and are those specific things going to have longevity and long lasting impact in your business? Thank you, Annie, for that. Also, we have another question. If brand finance values Whole Foods brand twice as high, does this not question brand valuation practices? <laughs> um, so I think one thing that would be good to talk about is what the difference is between our valuation and um, Amazon's valuation of Whole Foods brand. And, the main difference is the assumption over the useful economic life of that brand. Now, um, Amazon's assumption is that the Whole Foods brand has a useful economic life of 25 years. Um, there's no real reason for that. Um, even Whole Foods itself has been around for about 40 years and there's plenty of evidence that brands can last for hundreds of years. Um, so there's, there's no specific reason to anticipate that suddenly in 25 years time, that brand will stop having value. Um, our assumption on the other hand is that brands have an indefinite useful economic life. Um, not infinite, but indefinite. You can't say for sure if and when that, that brand will suddenly lose value. Um, Tavio, do you have anything that you'd like to add yeah. on that? Um, yeah, so I think that's, um, yeah, so that tackles the, the point about different assumptions that you use within, within the valuation. Um, I guess question allied to that sometimes that we get asked is, even though uh, there are all these standards out there, how do um, different uh, analysts come up with different uh, estimates of value of, uh, of brands? Um, and it really comes down to what their point of view is on the future income generating potential of the brand and what they believe impact they might have on the business. Um, it's almost in the same way as a, a stock analyst or an equity analyst looks at a uh, company uh, value. Uh, if you go and look at the value of Amazon and what analysts say the value is, you get a wide range. Uh, so really, you know, I think the goal here is to have as many um, points of view and opinions on the value of a brand. So that there's, um, there's almost a market. So you can get a consensus view of what, um, what the value of the brand is 
uh, much like um, we do with stock prices and company values. An additional question, um, how can we justify investing in an intangible asset study when we are facing budgetary constraints? Thank you, yeah, um, I mean, it's a good question. I imagine many organizations are currently facing um, budgetary constraints in the short term. Um, but for those companies who can afford to focus on long-term strategy, intangible assets could play a critical role in that. And as we saw earlier in the presentation, the role of intangibles has increased in recent years, and particularly for some industries, um, they're going to continue to being um, key drivers of value for those business. Um, so I guess it comes down to, as with any um, project investment opportunity, you need to weigh up the expected benefits versus the expected cost in the short run. Um, and if you're able to focus on your long-term strategy, we recommend um, focusing on intangible assets um, because in oftentimes they're overlooked um, and that can result in value um, being either um, underappreciated um, so that you, you don't get the same returns that you could have um, or in value being at risk um, and um, potentially making actions which erode value like what we saw with Burberry before um, before Angela Arendt came in and um, prevented that devaluation of the brand which had been occurring. So we're going to take uh, two more questions um, because um, um, we're closer to 3 p.m. But one of the uh, questions from uh, Charles Doyle is why are accountancy standards so slow to catch up with the realities of brand value? <laughs> um, so they always have to um, be aware of the challenges that um, the companies face in terms of value, valuing intangible assets. And to date, um, some of the reasons that, um, so specifically talking about these accounting standards surrounding um, intangible asset valuation, um, the, the issue with valuing internally and generated um, intangibles is that it's hard to estimate the actual cost of those intangibles. Um, and therefore, they think that there may be challenges in implementing that um, more globally. Um, those things we think um, have been overcome with the development of um, independent um, international standards on intangible asset valuation. But as with most things, um, it does take time um, for the Accounting Standards Board to, um, to discuss and to um, agree on ways forward. I mean, even at the moment, the ISAB are discussing whether they should be returning to goodwill amortisation despite many people in the industry, many auditors say that they think it's, it's a bad idea. Um, so I think with all changes in financial reporting policy, it has to get through um, a consensus in the board and they have to take time to um, receive feedback from, from players in the industry. Thank you, Annie. So one last question. Um, do you think that providing investors more information on intangible asset values could help curve or revaluations in stocks? Hi, uh, yes, yeah, I'll take this. Um, I think it, it wouldn't do any harm. Um, it, you know, it's another uh, another voice uh, of reason uh, to um, to help curb overvaluation uh, of stocks. I mean. A prime example um, is um, uh, certain uh, tech brands, uh, which you know are not grounded in reality with uh, traditional uh, valuation uh, um, methods. Uh, and even when you try to take account of the different intangibles that they have um, uh, in their portfolio, um, it still doesn't make sense. So, uh, yes, uh, we think that. It the main source uh, to help um, not overvalue uh, a certain stock. Okay. Um, we need to round the webinar off as it is past three o'clock. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you um, to our speakers. Um, a very complex and relevant subject and I think it was brilliantly presented. 
our next webinar uh, will take place on July 9th um, and it will focus on uh, soft power and why it matters to governments, people and brands. I would like to encourage all of you to fill out the survey uh, when you leave the webinar and to keep updated with future webinars, please visit our upcoming events tab in the Brown Finance Institute website. The Brown Finance Institute is starting a new uh, webinar series in July, highlighting different ecosystems of brand management, starting with um, the soft power of nation brands and following with sports business. With that, I will finish. Thank you, Annie and Savio, one more time. Thank you to all of you that have joined us today. And we will reconnect on July 9 in our next webinar on soft power. Thank you very much.